Express Truth back up in the building, man. And you see, we, we're coming at your visual again for the second time. Get used to this look, man. Get used to this look. And I'm here with a very special guest. I'm going to let him introduce himself. But before I do that, a lot of you have asked for this, you know. We got Mike T. Mike T is a big fan of this brother that I'm about to introduce. And we've seen him speaking many times, and this is a long overdue conversation. See what I'm saying? Craig. Yes, Craig my Pitney. brother. Yes, my brother. Well, go on, fam. Yeah, man. Thank you. And you know, it's an honor, man. It's been a while and we've been trying to get this situation yeah, popping, man. man. So, um, just as an introduction, Craig Pinkney, Birmingham based West Midlands. Um, I go by a number of hats. So, I'm a criminologist. Yes. Urban Youth Specialist and a lecturer at one of the local universities in Birmingham. Yeah. And also currently um, a PhD researcher, which is kind of looking at gang violence specifically in Birmingham and the correlation between social media and violence. Yeah. So that's what kind of I'm all about. So I do a lot of work with uh, young people in our community, yeah. predominantly young people that are involved in some aspect of violence. I work with their families, I work with their children, I work with their siblings. Um, and also train a lot of people to kind of make sense of what's going on in our community and how we can kind of break the cycle. So education ultimately is how I kind of strategize in engaging with young people to make sense of what yeah. I call the madness. Yeah, man, definitely. So we've got a few things we want to discuss today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, we, we did have a conversation about gun number six on Patreon. And the Patreons were very happy with how you presented yourself yeah. on that documentary. Mm -hmm. So the first place I want to start, yeah, drill music. Mm -hmm. We've had we've seen increased levels of crime yeah. taking place recently. Mm -hmm. I'd say the last eighteen months. We've seen we we had a quiet period, but it's come back to a period of like crime taking place. Yeah. And drill music, the news and um, heads a lot of heads of the community, if you could call them that, mm -hmm. they blame drill. Yeah. Now we had a conversation about this on the podcast. Yeah. What, what would you say about drill music? Would you say yeah. that there's any kind of responsibility yeah. on this genre? I think before we, or I attempt to answer that question, I think yeah. we have to understand violence first. Yes. Because what I don't want to do is kind of push this narrative that drill music is the reason why we have madness in our community. And I'm, it's going to sound like a hypocritical statement, yeah. but I feel like I have to break that down first. Please do, please First do. and foremost, we live in a violent society. Yeah. And in that violent society, it's embedded in every form of aspect within that particular society, within film, within games, within music, within culture. And I think we can go back thousands of years and understand that violence is something that is kind of a... Um, an increment into the way that we kind of manifest our understanding and the way that we behave in terms of our human kind of relationships. And I think that before we even talk about music, we need to understand what music is first. Yes. And music has always been an art form and in a way in which we can communicate to different peoples throughout ages of particular time. It was used to communicate from one group to another. It was used in war. It was used to kind of send subliminal messages to specific groups when we needed help, we needed care. Um, we needed um, assistance for any any uh, means. And music has always been a thing where human beings have always used it to kind of express their narrative through their lens. Yes. And I think it's important that we understand the different lenses from different peoples. But I think we've, before we kind of start talking about um, what the music is that we're essentially listening to, we can't ignore things like rock and roll. Yeah. You can't ignore other genres of music yeah. that also talk about aspects of violence. But then when we talk about music, what happens is, is there's a racialization of music. Yes. And when we talk about violence, there's kind of a synonymous discussion about violent music and automatically being music that comes from black peoples. And that's why I'm always hesitant about having this conversation about what we know as drill today. Yes. Because there's a danger of having this conversation and making the assumption that the music that is perpetuated predominantly by black young males within inner cities across this city or especially within um, America, if we're talking about places like Chicago, there's yeah. a danger of kind of making people believe that all violent music comes from us. Yeah. So I feel like I have to make that statement Please, first. Yeah. So when we're talking about drill music, is there a correlation between drill music and violence? Of course there is, and we can't ignore that. But then we have to also dissect that as well 
and understand that where does drill music come from? It comes from Chicago. What is significant about Chicago? Chicago is a murder capital of the world or is referred to as a murder capital of the world. But let's take it back in terms of Chicago. Yeah. Chicago was one of the places where the free slaves went to first. Yes. And the government Facts. and the state removed themselves from Chicago. And then we started to see a difference in the way in which people mobilized, the way that people behaved. Drugs came into their society. Um, poor housing, poor education went into their society and then it created those environments for individuals to behave certain types of ways as it relates to violence. So the music that came out of Chicago is a reflection of the reality what's going on with those children. So when we talk about the globalization of drill music and violence, let's take it back to London where you see your groups like Six Seven and others that were kind of like the forebearers of this particular type of music. Yes. And interestingly enough, the music that has generally got more popularity are also in the places that have high forms of crime rates in those particular cities. So as a researcher and an individual that's invested in understanding what um, happens in our particular communities, answering that question, well, why is it that drill music is so prominent in them same spaces that high crime rates are kind of, I would argue, um, visual in terms of the, the public landscape, landscape in terms of how we do things. And one of the interesting things is if you draw that correlation between Chicago and the UK, in them same inner cities, we have issues of poor housing, poor education, acute poverty, yes, the impact of austerity, we've got a mental health, a poor mental health in the community, lack of community investment, a lack of business investment that takes place in those communities. And what young people are also doing is talking about their lifestyles through the lens of what they see every single day. Problem I have with drill music is the capitalization and the consumerism around drill music. And I think that's the problem. Okay. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But to the answering your question just more directly, yes, drill music definitely has a correlation between violence. Why? Because the, the proponents that talk about their messages through their particular lens yeah. are talking about beef, that are talking about conflicts. And not only are they talking about conflicts, they're talking about what they're prepared to do to individuals that have a conflict with them or have a beef with them at a particular moment or time. Yeah, great answer still. Serious answer, man. So, all right. That's what, they seem to be getting the blame for everything that's taking place. My personal belief, we can't blame them solely, but they do have a lot to, to answer for. Of course. Plus, the people that are pushing that music tend to push the negative, the negative, they, they want that, that side of it to shine through because in turn, we see what happens. So, um, okay, drill music. So, I know you're coming from the same era as me mm -hmm. where rap wasn't what it is today. You could call it, Drill, rap, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. whatever it is. It wasn't what it is today. Mm -hmm. Now it's became what it is today. Yeah. It, do you think they're using it for the wrong reasons? When you say they are using it for the wrong reasons, who? The acts. The, the people artists, that perform yeah, in it. Yeah. Like, um, it's, is it just a situation where, and I hate to really put it like this, but we're going we're gonna to be no filter on yeah, this. Yeah, of course. Is it a situation where it's just people from the road rapping now? Is that what it is? Be I think what you got to also understand as well is the society that we're in as well. As I said, we're in a post-capitalist society where we're, everything is about consumerism. Yeah. And within that, it's about supply and demand. So the deeper question is, is then if drill music wasn't important and people didn't want it, people wouldn't use it. So if you're talking about man from the road particularly, the only reason why they're engaging in this type of music, because they know that there's a profit of that, it can be monetized. Of then course. the deeper question is as well, then who is the person that benefits from the monetization of drill music? So we can take it back. That it's a, not a new conversation and not a new question that you're asking. Even if you talk about gangster rap in particular, it's not a new conversation. Let's take it back. Let's take and it we back. can go back yeah. and talk about hip hop as a genre of music. And again, music has always been a tool and art an expression of science to translate thoughts, feelings, ideas of people at a particular time in history. So when hip hop historically came to the Western Hemisphere, what was it about? It was during a time of oppression. It was during a time of um, colonialism, colonialism in the world. Yes. It was at a time of apartheid going on in the world. It was at a time of inst uh, institutional and structural racism was impacting people of color 
across the Western Hemisphere. So when people were talking about their messages and their narratives, what were they talking about? They were talking about the struggle. Fight the power. They were talking about fighting of power. And what that meant is fighting the system and the system of racism that ultimately impacts all forms of people of colour, whether it's in education, whether it's in entertainment, whether it's in economics, whether it's in politics, whether it's in law, whether it's to do with sex, whether it's to do with war, those people of colour ultimately were being impacted by the system of white supremacy. And that's what they were talking about. So then what then happened in terms of a, a fundamental shift or paradigm shift in the way in which we then started to tell our story we can't ignore that. Remember, it was the CIA that brought drugs into the country. That's a and fact. there's so many documentaries and films now, Snowfall in Snowfall, particular, I that, that are talking about what actually happened. You can go to Panther, the film Panther that spoke about the Black Panther movement yeah, yeah, and what was that. happening in America. And I think Snowfall is kind of um, giving you an indication of what happened before the Black Panther movement or just after the Black Panther movement. And at that particular time in America, what was happening was drugs was coming into the country and those communities that had structure, had power, that were doing for themselves in the community, a lot of those individuals from those particular groups either became the dealers or they became consumers of buying those drugs. And the breakdown in their particular groups meant that they lacked the kind of social bond to in order to fight against things that were coming from the outside in. So then they started to fight amongst each other. Yeah. So the whole notion of the concept of gangs in America or West, in the West particular, if we talk about, for example, places like LA, Crips and Bloods was birthed after that. Yes, We can't ignore that. So then yeah. now when we talk about gangster rap, what were those young men talking about? They were talking about what was going on through their lens at that particular time. Problem is, however, is that what we don't ever talk about is the people that came in and said, you know what, this is profitable. Yeah. We can make some money from this, yeah. from the stuff that you're talking about. So you free man that claim to be from your community, why don't you talk about that stuff? Because talking about fighting the power no more, there's really not no supply and demand for that. But at the time... But time. no, but you have to understand what's going on. So you got to yeah. remember that if you've got people that are coming from marginalized communities that feel alienated within a wider society, if somebody comes with a proposition, I'm not saying we have to agree with the proposition, yeah. but you have to understand that some men are going to take that opportunity. No different to if men are in the ends and there's no work going, some men are going to try and find work, but understand some men are going to want to sell drugs as well. That's and in the fact. same concept of what was going on during gangster rap, you then had young people in them same communities then saying, you know what, I'm going to take that opportunity. And then, you know what, I'm going to talk about what's going on in my community. Now, twofold in terms of what happens there. So it makes money to those institutions, those corporate companies that seek to utilize the, the death and the slaughter that goes on in those particular communities in order to make profit. And that's why how we knew about all of the gangster rappers that were coming out of America. However, the second part to that twofold is that those that live within those communities hear those messages. They respond to those messages. Their understanding of how they deal with conflict, how they deal with women, how they deal with men, how they deal with any kind of problem is based on their role models that translate those stories through music. Yeah. And then it becomes part of culture. Then we internalize it as culture. Then we start to believe it as culture and say, you know what? It's just the way that it is. So let's fast forward to now drill music or let's go back to grime and anything else. Those young people that come from indigenous UK, whether black, British or other, likewise are communicating those same narratives that's going on in their community. And we have to be honest, is it violent in the inner city? Of course it is. Birmingham, West Midlands is the gun crime capital of the UK. So if a young man is talking about the fact that he lives in an environment where men are blasting off every now and then, am I wrong to say that he shouldn't talk about that? Yes and no. Because yes, you're supposed to tell us what's going on in your society through your lens. Yeah. But that same man knows that by putting that on YouTube, by putting that on um, Spotify, by creating a little, little buzz for yourself on Instagram, there's going to be a monetization of that. So why wouldn't you do that if that same young man feels that that else ain't going on for him? So I'm not saying that's wrong, but what we need to start to have a conversation about is the system. So when we come, when we yeah, have conversations get, about when we have hard. conversations about yeah. music, yeah. and this is not to go on a sidetrack, but what I'm saying yeah. is we can't look at Drew music as kind of a 
um, a one particular segment yeah. of a wider society that creates the environment for young men and young women to want to do those particular things. And what I'm saying is those that ultimately get destroyed through that kind of transition of music yeah. is us. Definitely. In the community, our young people that look up to these individuals, our people that ultimately believe that the messages that are coming out from these individuals is the truth. That kind of nihilistic mentality, get rich or die trying, don't want to die young, want to live a certain type of way, you're going to blast the man if a man disrespects you, and so on and so forth. But what we can't ignore is the wider system and that wider system that benefits yeah, from those getting... same particular types of narratives. So it all depends on where you stand in terms of the story. If you're a parent, and you're a member of the community and you're a person that's trying to work with young people, of course you're going to say drill music, you don't want it. Yes. But if you're coming from a corporate perspective, you're going to say you want drill music, but ultimately, who does it benefit and who doesn't it benefit? We don't benefit other than individuals benefit in yeah. small groups that make Never it. Collectively. But as a collective, we don't benefit. It server destroys us. And as I said, this is not a new conversation. It's not a new story. And the way that gangster rap destroyed communities in America, drill music is destroying our communities in and the same type of way. That's a fact. And what I want to, what I want to explain, because what you're saying is, I'm taking it all in, but the problem what I have with the artists, yeah, that, and not just drill, just with this new um, influx of like UK success. Yes. Yeah. It's, they're promoting, we do have crime yeah. and me and you both come from these communities yeah. and we do have crime, we do have um, these things taking place. But why is it that they're only speaking about this? Now I understand that it does, it does make money. Yes. It definitely makes money. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that's not the only life these guys are living 24-7. Of course. And is it mm -hmm. our youth that are, that are pushing this music to the forefront? Is it our youth that are giving them these streams? It's a lot of people that are in the... That, Different places, which mm -hmm. I've said before, places that ain't in the inner cities yes. that are that are looking at these guys as superheroes, that are looking at these guys mm -hmm. as ah, oh, this is happening down mm -hmm. there and that's happening. You got guys in Blackpool that are probably hearing yeah, man's yeah. banging mm -hmm. and doing all of that, mm -hmm. but this is just a small part yes. of what goes on in the mm -hmm. inner city. Yeah. There's so much different other stories to tell, mm -hmm. but only this one yeah, story yeah, yeah. is told. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Who's at the forefront of these things? Yeah. Who's pushing these narratives? Of course, well, it's us. And it goes back yeah. to my point that I'm making. If you're talking about the concept of supply and demand in a capitalist society, it would seem that we are the ones that can engage in that demand. We can supply it because we're talking about our narratives and a wider context of violence as it relates to the monetization of the violence. Then we only want to hear your stories, but no different to watching Narcos on Netflix. No different to when we used to grow up and watch any of those mob bosses type of documentaries in the same way. We want to yeah. watch it. We want to see those experiences. When we were growing up, we wanted to watch Boys in the Hood. We wanted to watch Menace in Society. But and, I'm not even cutting you off, Craig. Well, With these things that you mentioned, yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I was big on them, them, mm -hmm. them mob films, Goodfellas, and yeah, yeah. Eddie Bronx Tale, whatever mm -hmm. you can mention, yeah. Boys in the Hood. But there was always a message at the end of mm -hmm. it there was always that music at the end of it. That music ain't at the end of yeah, what yeah. I'm seeing in today, Craig. No, but, but you, 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 it's important though that we kind of unpack that as well. Yeah. Because we have to be honest, when we were growing up watching Boys in the Hood and Men in Society, yeah. we were not paying attention to Laurie Fishburne. We wasn't that, paying attention those to... those were there. No, no, they were, no, no, no yeah. hear me? The jewels were there, but we weren't paying attention to them. What I'm trying to get you to go into is the mind of a young person that is 13 now. Yes. As yes, I said, I we're logical yeah, yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. So when I hear a drill music song, I'm not listening to the banging. I'm listening to pain. I'm listening to mental health. I'm listening to the struggles of individuals that go through those experiences every every single day. You're hearing my point? Yeah, I hear that. Does that make sense? That. So I'm aware, we're coming from a perspective of understanding. Yeah. But I also understand a 13-year-old that's listening to the same man I'm listening to is not hearing the same messages I'm hearing. So that's why I use Boys in the Hood as a perfect example. We didn't hear about gentrification. We didn't yeah. hear about that's the psychological impact of absent fathers. We didn't hear about mental health. We didn't hear about pain and the impact of engaging with certain types of people in a certain lifestyle and how the system has set up a trap for us to fail. We weren't hearing those messages. We just wanted to see what Doughboy was on. We just wanted <laughs> yeah. to see what man was doing. Man didn't really like Trey because you shouldn't have got out of the car. You should have <laughs> ride for the man. Them. That were the messages that we got. As we've got older, we've looked at those particular things now and now we start to analyse and think, you know what, that was deep. Man were talking about gentrification in the 90s. Yeah. 
a man's talking about gentrification now like it's a new concept that happens in our society. So going back to my point, when these young men push these particular narratives that doesn't appear to be positive, you have to also understand what they're actually saying. So as a criminologist and as an individual that works in the community to help individuals come away from certain types of behaviours, yeah. I will use them same types of music videos in my sessions with young people to get them to review themselves in terms of how they live their lives. And guess what? In them same videos, they're like, you know what? I didn't even realise that. I say, you know what? Just listen to that one verse. What do you hear? My man's just talking about madness. All right, then let's look at mental health. What were some of the key things that he mentioned in his lyrics? Yeah. Right, I didn't even realise a man was talking about that, you know. But is he talking it from... Are they talking about it from an aspect of pain? Well, of course they are. Would you say so? Or is it Why? Because if, Of course you're talking about for both. Because, because, because if I'm saying... I mean, I could say... You can look at the cup half full or half empty. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I could say, this is going on. That's going on. Yeah. And I can talk about it in a, in a negative way, like of this course. needs to change. Mm -hmm. Or I can glorify this lifestyle. But it depends what you define as glorification. Because if, if you're talking to a psychiatrist yeah. and you're talking to somebody that understands psychiatry in the way that people think, they're not going to come with the same evaluation that you're going to come through. Because that's yeah. the same, I say my point again. So when I hear the music, I hear pain and I hear destruction that comes through pain. So there's that old saying of hurting people hurt people. Yes. And how do you express that hurt? So it may come across negative. It may have come across like madness. But I'm hearing in the small nuanced things that take place when they're talking about, you know what, man have to hit the road and do certain types of things. Well, you don't have to. But do I understand what's going on in terms of their surroundings and their particular types of environments? And that's what I'm saying. In order for me to understand where young people are at in 2019 and beyond, we need to start to listen to what their narratives are. Not agreeing with the narratives. I'm making that clear. Yeah, yeah, but you yeah. have to understand where they're coming from. Because unless you understand where they're coming from, you can't understand how to then put things into place to try and reverse some of those things that have been pushed out by that. And then you've got also talk about the hyper-consumerism that's around it, which are all the kind of distractions that get thrown in between. So put on some Dior um, trainers, throw on some Chanel trainers, put on a Fendi t-shirt, and all of those things are distractions to make us not think about the things that are coming out in those particular types of messages. I mean, you get my point? Yeah, yeah, I mean, So yeah, I mean, when those yeah. things actually take place, it takes us away from understanding what these young men are talking about because the wider conversation that we don't talk about is the impact of austerity the impact of poverty the impact of mental health the impact of communities feeling that they're under resourced and believe that the only way they're going to get out of their circumstance is through madness selling drugs and otherwise which is not true which is not true yeah. but we have to understand and that goes back to my earlier point about understanding the system and a system creates an environment in order for these things to manifest. And then we blame people for then talking about the circumstances in which they're victims of. So there's victims from multiple levels. The only people I see benefiting from this wider system are the individuals that enable these young men to go onto these platforms to talk about their distress and their particular issues that they go through all the time. So going back to your other point about the youths from Blackpool, they don't come from that environment don't. where there's lack of resources, lack of poverty, or poverty, sorry, or they're coming from schools that are poor educated, however. So when they listen to the music, they can distinguish the difference between fake and reality. They can distinguish the difference and think, well, you're talking about not doing that and then you're standing on the corner. But the reality is I can go to a youth centre. I actually can go to events and things that are going to help me in terms of my independent understanding about how I'm going to live my life. But a youth that's living around the corner in Hockley Blood or Winston Green or Newtown or Lazales and whatnot, when they hear this music, where's the youth centre? Where's the community leaders? Where's the people in that particular narrative? But those, so, those so, people ain't being risen up, Craig. No, they haven't been risen up, yeah. but, but I have to, you have to, I'm going back to my point again. Yeah. You have to understand where these young people are at in real time because we can theorize and we can have these debates about what's going on. But until you talk to a 13 and 14 year old in real time and ask him how he hears the music and what he learns from the music, we're not going to get any further in terms of trying to make changes. So what I'm trying to give us is an understanding of three levels the corporate world, the man them that are making the music and the community that's receiving it. The one that loses always is going to be the community that receives it. Always going to be the people that are acting out, even though it may look like 
They're making money financially and whatever. And we've seen in so many different stories that a man can have money and still get luck up. Yeah, that's you a can fact. still put fifty bags in your car. You still get luck up, and we can still look at America in the same thing of anybody of color that has achieve something and then got to certain parts within the world because of their finance and their achievements and whatnot and still be treated unfairly by the system. So the yeah. system of racism, we can't get away from. We can't, we can't get away from the fact that this system is designed for all of us to fall down. And what I'm That's saying is fact. music yeah. has been used also as another avenue for our onslaught. And we're both victims and perpetrators in that same system is the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. And we have to look at, more importantly, if we are perpetrators, what are we perpetrating? And the perpetrating is what you're saying is in terms of we don't have to. And I'm saying, yeah, we don't. But in that same victim, in that same system, we're then saying, then how else are we going to make money? And this is where we need to rise up and show man that, you know what, you don't have to make money that particular type of way. And even if you are going to, yeah, you can be a, a, a manager, you can be a label of course. owner. Of course. You can control that. You can control, you can control the narrative. You control the narrative. But instead, everyone wants to be in front of the camera. Of course. You can be behind the camera. Of course. Because like I said, the heads of all of this don't look like you and me. Of course. The people that push the music out don't look like you and me. Yep. The people that decide what gets playlisted don't look like you and me. And we've just seen that with the event that took place the other day yes. in Birmingham, mm -hmm. with the BBC One Extra yeah. event, anybody who was of the culture, and I don't mean colour, I yes. don't mean race, mm -hmm. anyone who was of the culture, who yes. understands the culture, yes. would have known that as a recipe for of disaster. Course. Of course. The correct mm -hmm. procedures weren't in place. Yeah. They didn't set it up, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Now you tell me, mm -hmm. there was a, I've, I've, I've been there in UK, but I'm mm -hmm. not almost gone, and I've yeah, been yeah, there them times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm saying, yeah, yeah. now it's popping. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. still don't control yeah, it. Yeah, of course. What's going mm -hmm. on, Greg? But it's ultimately that same thing that you just mentioned, and I'm going to agree with you. Yeah. That you know what? That this kind of idea that we just want to be in front of the camera and we just want to be the 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 people that are kind of getting the glitz and the glamour in the moment, yeah. as opposed to thinking about how we can own yeah. the industry Ownership. and how we can lead the industry in terms of where where we want to go. And not to just kind of get at people, because there are people in the community and actually people that are in the business that are on that path to do that. And there's people that have accomplished many things. I mean, we have to talk about the vast majority. Yeah. And the vast majority of men that just want that kind of recognition. But I have to take it deeper again as why you are doing that. Yeah. Because you've yeah. also got to understand that we have an identity crisis too. And that's what I'm yeah. saying. If it's talk about the system and the environment that's being created, most men that engage in this type of behavior is not because... They want to do it because they want to own anything. I'm only doing it because I just want to be seen. Yeah. I just want to be heard. So when we have yeah. to, so as a researcher, as an academic, I have to ask the questions, why? Why is it? Why do you want to just be seen? Why do, do you just want to be heard? Because again, if you live within a society where you're seen or not seen or unheard, you are going to do things, unfortunately, to be seen and heard. We've got a platform, so we get heard. You've got an amazing platform where people are going to watch. You're being seen, you're being heard. But let's go back to that same 13, 14 year old that lives in the community yeah. that the system set up for him to fail anyway. He does the wrong thing at school, he's gone. He acts up in school, he's got ADHD. He may end up in a pupil referral unit that's going to put him on the, the school to prison well, pipeline I'm, I'm, in there. So I'm not in, in the board. Go on. Me and you was once that 13 year old. Of course. And Stephen too. Of course. How did we get around that? How do we get around that? Yeah, I, would, I, mean? I, I can talk for myself. Please. And I believe that it's the extra things that I received and the individuals that I was around in order to help me to get out of that. So I don't use this kind of, because I did it, everybody else can do it. When I lived I in Huckley around the corner, yeah. and I think there's enough black people that do that as well, and we must stop it. You know, yeah. I mean, we have this kind of mentality because I did it, everyone else can do it. Because you have to look at math. And when yeah. I'm talking about the community that I came from, in the 32 houses that I lived, everybody went to the same school. Everybody lived with their mom. Everyone was, but what, why, why did man them start doing some madness? But then I have to look, what did I have different? I was the only one that had a dad in the yard. I went Saturday school. I went kickboxing. You go my I went Saturday place, school? I went uh, 104. No, I was no, no, no. Yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. saying, man, at Hockley Port, yeah, had extra activities that we were doing, yeah, that I'm not saying for certain. I had all that, too. but I have you to right? look at, yeah, what other man had that was different. 
So if yeah. I look at my bedroom next door that ended up in the, some sort of madness, I think, well, what was different? That's why I said boys in the hood. That's what I'm talking about, those gems that were coming through. Yes. The psychological impact of absent fathers. Yeah. I realised that enough men don't have their dad. Enough men are going through pain. Enough men are trying to understand what it is to be a man in a society that tells man that in order for you to get through in society, you have to move a certain type of way. Well, listen, now you don't need to move like that. That's what Laris Fishburne was doing with his son. Yeah. You don't have to move like them, man. And I'll show you in 10 years' time, when you grow up, you're going to start seeing how these men move. So I use that in terms of my understanding. I'm not saying my pops is Laris Fishburne, but Natty watching this, you know, you can hold a, a halo <laughs> on this one. Yeah. But the point that I'm making, though, is that those extra um, intersections between fatherhood is what helped me. Yes. So when I look at a lot of the youths that I work with that don't have dads, a lot of the youths that I work with that are involved in madness, they've got fathers, but their dads don't play an active a, that's role. That's a grassroots problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, grassroots problem. There's other, other issue that also yeah. takes place in that they come from schools that don't teach them about self-enlightenment, don't teach them about self-development, don't teach them to love themselves. In the same environment that they live, they believe that the community are hostile yeah. and everybody's a threat. So your crisis, based on your identity, is trying to establish a little name for yourself because a basic human need is self-esteem. We can't, we can't ignore that. Yeah. So if your self-esteem has been removed by the state, by family, by community, then you're going to want to be seen. You want to be heard in a particular way. Yeah. So again, what is marketed to the young people that in order for you to be seen and heard in the communities that you come from has to be the latest trainers. You have to have a Gucci hat. Fact. So a man is wearing a Gucci hat till it's turning brown. Yeah. But it don't Gucci matter. Belt, the Gucci strips there. You remember the times the man's tucking in their uh, T-shirts so you can see the bottle. So you can see the buckle. Like Hulk, like Hulk Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The hat's turning brown. The belt's turning brown. The pouch is mash up. The pouch is mash up. Your jeans are mash up. Your trainers are lean. It don't matter though because the Gucci strips there. So in those same environments, we then look at those particular images those particular labels and we put them in high regard yeah and in that high regard we're just happy to be seen and happy to be heard so let's go into the the fact that we now live in a society now where social media is out there and enables people to talk about themselves and we can't talk about nas we can't talk about that and ignore the concept of narcissism which yeah. is what my PhD is all about. And I argue yeah. that social media platforms create that environment for narcissistic behavior to happen. Yeah, that's a fact. So again, using that same thing with the youth from Blackpool, he might not have an issue with his identity yeah, because he lives in an environment where things is okay. Yeah, there might be issues in terms of the community, but generally things are okay. So put social media in a community where young people don't have a knowledge of self. They come from environments where don't really teach them about who they are and what they are and what they should put as high regard and they allow the same capitalist system that's designed to make them fall into that trap tell them what they should put in high regard. So I'm not interested in what you're saying to me, big man, because I want that Gucci hat. That's and better still, I'm going to take a picture of it and I'm going to post it on Instagram. And then when I post it on Instagram, I'm going to get 200 likes. So ignore what you're saying because right now, that's the only thing for me right now that is giving me some sort of something yeah. that's making me feel a certain type of way. Now, if you online tell me that, yo fam, your hat looks brown, you know, blood, and then 10 people start liking that, 15 people start laughing, guess what I'm prepared to do to you online? I'm prepared to boss your head. Yeah. I'm going to tell you when I see you, that's what I'm going to do. Now, can you blame the young man for that, or do we have to dissect that and look at the impact of social media on the mind of our young people and also the mental health of our young people in those particular situations? So let's put that in terms of music. Young people realise also now that, wait there, if I'm going to be popular, if I'm going to be seen in a high regard, then I need to start putting some bars together. Yeah, I'm going to go on camera and I'm going to push that. So my intention is nothing to do with music. It's not to necessarily make it in the business. Because I want to message out either. Because I want to be seen and heard. Yeah. But we have to understand. But we, we have to it. understand that as well. We have to be seen and heard. I wouldn't even use it clout. I wouldn't use the word clout. I would use it identity crisis. Yeah. And until we start to understand what's going on with us as a people and as a community and the distractions that are put in front of us in order for to, for us to behave those particular ways on particular platforms, it's important. But we can't then ignore the 
impact of social media and it has on the mind of our young people. There was a documentary that came out last year, you might remember it, it was looking at Facebook and the yeah. question that was being asked was, is Facebook and social media platforms making our children addicted? And they were going to individuals that were top programmers and asking them these particular questions and none of them didn't want to answer. So I'll go back to my point again, that we look at young people, we kind of blame young people in our society, yeah. but what we don't ever talk about the are root. the things that are created in order for these behaviours to manifest. So you think about it from the perspective of a youth that's coming from an inner city. Now, I'm not going to say all young people are going to be like this, but let me just use the same analogy that I came from. So the same community, 32 houses. Out of those 32 houses, there's two fathers in the households of those 32 houses. So in them 30 houses, is it likely that those young people are going to become violent? No. But let's take it a step further. If then there's no opportunities in that community, those 30 households, how are they going to make ends meet? So let's just slash that down to 15 and say 15 people are good. They make a situation for themselves. Yeah. The last 15 families that are there, poor education come from houses. Five houses get excluded. 10 got through education. Let's take it a step further. Mental health is rife within our community. Of those same households and those five, five, five households, two are impacted by mental health because maybe a mom's got mental health yeah. issue around depression. Mm. Um, my older sibling's got issue around depression. So there's three families that have been impacted by these issues. Yeah. Now, we can then start to look at what goes on in our communities and the young people that may live in those two or three households, what's available for them? Now, we can just be like, yeah, 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 but anybody can go through that and end up in a scenario and not necessarily do that. Yeah. And I'm saying that I agree. But we can't ignore the fact that this is an issue that takes place in a lot of inner city communities where the whole social makeup in order to ensure that children are safe, ensuring that children are in a space where they can, you know, live to their highest potential and fulfill all of their hopes and dreams and goals that they once had when it was at primary school. You start to yeah. understand that there's so many issues and a strain and tension is created when you know you can't achieve those things. So if yeah. we go to options based on those same families that I think of, then what options are available in them same communities? If there's no jobs, if there's no opportunities, if there's no resources, if role models are in the community that yeah. haven't ri been risen to the point where they're visually in the community and then they watch media, they watch social media, that tell those same people that we are both the perpetrators and the victims of a wider system of violence. What is that young man supposed to believe and think when they're navigating yeah. themselves? And then yet still the man them on the corner that seem to be doing okay or appear to be doing okay, yeah. are doing it through shutting, doing it through going up and down the road on yeah. county lines, or they seem quite talented and they can put bars together because it's an art to be able to can stand up and put bars together, together yeah. and be able to perform those things. And if I have that, that ability to be able to put bars together, then I'm going to do it. Not because I want to be a big star, it's because you know what, maybe by doing this, is going to enable me to get some sort of recognition and help me boost my self-esteem. And you can use that same analogy on when I've worked with young people that are extremists and have gone on to do some madness or want to do a madness. Individuals that have gone on to become um, organisers of trafficking organizations and whatnot. When you go back to the root and you start to realize the things that they didn't have and the things that they didn't have the opportunity to be um, a part of, you start to realize that certain people make choices. So let's go back to the options. And if the options happen to be drugs, violence, gangs, or going on camera and chatting nonsense, then young people unfortunately are taking those options. So young people then are products of their environment. But what we keep doing is blaming the young people and we don't blame the environment. And we that, then don't invite, we don't then blame the individuals yeah. who are doing that. So I'm always going to say I'm a defender of young people. Yeah. But I'm also going to call out the madness that they do as well. So even with me saying that, I'm saying we don't have to. Yeah. But at the same time, that's why I said to you in the beginning, it might sound like a hypocritical statement yeah. that I'm making. Because if drill seems to be the only available option for the man them right now, Guess what's going to happen? The man them are going to use the option until we 
start to give them alternative options and say, you know what? You actually don't need to be in front of the camera chatting nonsense. You actually can be behind the camera. You actually can create your own label. You actually can do so many other things to be a part of those, uh, or be a part of the culture as opposed to the things that you believe that you have to. And then a wider conversation then is also then, why is it that we believe we're the ones that need to talk about violence? Because statistically, we are not the ones that commit more knife crime in this country. We don't. It's a myth about black yeah, and black myth, crime. That's a myth, that's we a talk myth. about this black and black crime and what the hell the black and cri- black and black crime mean? Because statistically, we're not killing each other more than any other group. White males commit more knife crime activities based on any other group within this particular country. But when we talk about knife crime as a concept, again, it's been racialized. It's been put in a context that a youth that's walking up the road with a knife, that's knife crime. No, if you look at any criminal justice agency, knife crime also acknowledges the fact that people that carry sharp objects. Okay, so a man yeah, in his yeah. yard that stabs his wife and a madness, that's considered knife crime. Yeah. According to the Crime Prosecution Service. But then we don't include that in terms of the debate. So then you have these presenters, you have these individuals that go online and talk about, you know what, we've got an issue about black and black crime and black and black violence and whatnot. And we, we kind of push this narrative that it's just us. No, it's not just us. However, we are hurting each other. We are harming each other in our communities and we can't ignore that. And we have to also break down why we're doing that. And when you go down into the why, you then start to break down all of those different segments yeah. in our community, in our society that make us behave the way that we do because we're angry. Historically, we're angry. Intergenerationally, we're angry. We haven't dealt with our mental health. So we yeah. can't have this conversation without talking about mental health Facts. and how mental health has been passed down from generations of pain because of struggle. We can't ignore that. So if we're in a community where mental health seems to be a thing of everyday behaviour and a culture that we've embedded as normal, man walking up the road like this. It's mental health. But what we do is we internalise that as, that's just the way that the man then move though. But, but, and a very big but, a lot of these individuals, we're angry at each other. If that anger was channeled into a different place, we might get a different result. But before we get back to that, I just want to... No, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with that, though. Go on, As then. a challenge, though. Yeah. Because, again, we talk about these things as if they can just change like that. Yeah. So I'm going to pull it into... If I brought a psychiatrist in front of you right now, yeah. he's going to tell you you're wrong. You can't just change it like that. We have to go through a therapeutic intervention no, but in you're, order but to you're, change... If I see you... Remember, we came, we're coming from a place, Craig, where... Yeah, go on. I could be walking on the road, yeah? Yeah. Remember, I've had in-depth conversations yeah. with my granddad who called yeah, me yeah, out, yeah. Of and we used to queue up to have a bath at Hansworth yes, Swimming of course. Park. And yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, and yes. in them days, a man, I'd see you as a brother and yeah, of course. smile and nod. Yeah, yeah, of course. I don't yeah, even yeah, know yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where did that change? They, they had, the poverty weren't as bad then. The poverty was worse then than what it is now. So when did we lose that spirit? I, I disagree in terms yeah, of... So you think when we you, came from the yard, we had it, more? It depends what you define as poverty. Okay. I and this is what I'm saying. We, we can't have these conversations and throw these terms. Living and circumstances. Mean, so when we, when we came into the country, yes. Living it, circumstances. It was, it was, racism. It was, it, was, it was difficult, but now racism is institutionalized. Definitely. So Definitely. That, but that, that, even, even that point that you've but just... But it was both no, then, no, no, It no. was both then, though? Yes or no? But it was the, systematic, and it was, it was no. It's always always been systematic. Yeah. But we came in a time when a man would say to you, "What you looking at, you nigger? We don't want you people here. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Yeah. Overt racism is very different to covert racism. Yeah. And the impact of covert racism and institutional racism impacts us through policy legislation." implementation of policy, the way that people treat us, the way that people uh, engage with us in all of these forms of education, entertainment, economics, politics, law, the implementation of law and all of those other things, that is fundamentally different. We can't make that go over people's heads. So yes, I can talk to my dad and my grandparents right now and they went through serious racism. My dad used to talk about worse racism. Running, running. Worse racism, no, Craig. Depend and I'm going to get back to that. But go on, no, finish your when point. They no. say, when I'm going yeah. to challenge the concept of worse. Yeah. I'm not going to say anybody's um, experience is worse than anybody else's. I think that's wrong that we do that. But what, yeah. I, what I am going to hold it, opinion, yeah. say, what I am going to say though, my dad would say to me yeah. that back in the day when the Rasta generation and under SOS law, Fed man was thumping up black man, hanging them, hanging them from from Fornero police station. 
And I'm going to say to you, you know what, Dad? You're right. That was deep. My dad will say, yo, Unalak don't know about what we was going through. But I'm going to say, you know what, Dad? In the criminal justice system, we get sentenced harshly and way more than any other counterpart in the group. We get stopped and searched way more than anybody else. Currently, we get sectioned more than any other group in the country. Yeah. So when you use the concept of worse, what do you mean? Because if I was to talk about statistics right now, I'm going to win in terms of talking about statistics right yeah. now. So that's why I'm not going to say <laughs> yeah, yeah, anybody's yeah. situation is yeah, worse yeah, yeah, than yeah, anybody yeah, else's. Yeah, yeah. But what you're talking about is overt versus covert. Yeah. What I'm saying is covert is worse. In the sense of mm. when you're talking about policy and policies designed to shape the way that people move every single day yeah. is very different to a man saying to me, you know, I don't like you because you're black. Because I, I, I don't really care what you think about me. And if you want to yeah. throw hands, I'm going to throw hands back. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, different. Yeah. Yeah. That's different Let's to you making sure that I can't provide for my family. There's a big difference in terms of that. That's a fact. And I think that if I can, if I can put something in place that is going to enable your children's children to not benefit from my decision right now, I'm going to argue that that's way more worse than a man punching me in the face. But I would never say that. And that's why I'm not going to go down the road of saying this person's uh, situation or our people's struggle yeah. is worse than that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what I will sense, say yeah. though is understanding the difference of how racism works and how racism has manifested and recruit the environments in which racism has created to make our people do that. And then as an attached to that, the concept of self-hate has also been birthed and yeah. also been manifested, which is historical. It's not new. Yeah. So when you're talking about the fact that many of us came, we had to come together. Yeah. During the Windrush, we had to, we had no choice. Banking system is not like the banking system right now. But now we have this perceived notion of freedom and everybody's good and everybody's all right now. Now we just, we just kind of have this idea we, now we, that, you know what, but I'm Chris. How comes my man is not Chris? We, we, but we haven't dealt with the mental health yeah, though. We, we haven't. We haven't. So we but haven't. part of that mental health is self-hate though. Yeah. Part of that self-hate. So even though I'm saying, yeah, cool, but deep down I'm thinking, you know, I don't really trust my man, you know. I don't really like, how comes my man's looking, how comes your hat's better than my hat though? And all of those things that kind of pro proponent that make us think about all of these things about self-hate, we, we put that, that on each other. other. We, we only say that to each other. But that's the, that's the mission. Asian man coming no, but, here now. But, but forget about that no, for a moment. When he comes in, forget, he could have the most Forget desire. about that for a moment. Yeah. Going back to my point again, yeah. of the understanding the system of racism. Racism is not just the way that you talk to me and the way that people mistreat us, a part of that is also how we behave amongst each other. Yeah. And until you understand the dynamics of racism from an African-centered perspective, yeah. you're going to use the word racism and not know what it means. The Oxford definition of racism is going to talk about um, the fact that you don't like someone and the discriminatory practice that takes place. Yeah. No, racism is prejudice plus power. But what is that power? And how does that power manifest in the sub- subliminal and the conscious and subconscious behaviors whether through language through behavior through thought patterns how do those things manifest in the way that we behave all the time and if all of those things can manifest in the way that we deal with each other a certain type of way that helps us to understand then why the youths are also in an environment where they love each other but hate each other at the same time. Yeah. That also helps you to understand that when you're in a car at the lights and a man looks at you and, and three men are looking in a car like, yo, it's about to go off just because you looked into the car for three seconds. That helps you to understand about the birth of, of self-hate and how self-hate is manifested in that same environment that is perpetuated that you're the bad guy, you're the demon, you're the man that you should be angry with. So it's important to understand that over times of our people that we've been through struggles, we've been through pain, Yeah, you know, we've been through agony. And my analysis is that we haven't gone through that pain. We're talking about the pain, but we're not talking about what that pain actually is. So you look at Dr. DeGray's work that talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome. It's a real thing, but we don't talk about that. That's so, what, you know what, so, imagine, so, that's my next, that's what I'm leading no, but, into. But, no, but now you, you get my point now. Yeah, yeah, I get your now point. Now you get yeah, my yeah, point now that point. we can't just say, oh, the youths them need to channel without understanding the therapeutic interventions that we may need in order to help youths understand where they're at and where they should be at. Because in order for me to go through my pain, I've had to go through counselling, bro. Yeah. And that's me. 
Yeah, I hear I'm about that. to go to a therapeutic intervention. So what, what's us to think that these youths that are I, on the I, road I, and I the madness that, every single that, day. Everyone's an individual. Yeah, everyone's yeah, a, yeah, but yeah, what yeah, I'm saying is I've understood because of the type of people that I'm around. Yeah. I've understood that I've needed to go through that. Yeah. So if I've needed to go through that, then the man that I'm working with that's talking about all he wants to do is lick off a man's head just because he's from another postcode. Yeah, that's madness. It's mental health. Yeah, that's mental health. But we're not framing it as mental health. Yeah. What we're framing it as is man them just need to start going unlike the bad. Man them just need to start, start moving a certain way. But what I'm yeah. saying is we, I'm arguing that we shouldn't. We can't. That's my argument. We can't that's talk my like premise. that. No, I'm saying we shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying I understand why we do. Yeah. But what I am saying is that we shouldn't because if you look at it from the lens of mental health, yeah. you're going to realise that our people are in a bad state and our people need healing. And if we don't understand that we're in a bad state, no matter what you put in front of them in that particular time, that's going to happen. Let me just change it. A woman that's gone through domestic violence, rape. Yeah. You can say, oh yeah, you need to challenge, channel your behavior and do something different and whatnot. Mm. But you know, and I know if that that woman hasn't gone through an intervention that's helped deal with the trauma that she's had to deal with from men abusing their power over that woman. We would all be in agreement and say, you know what? Until that woman goes through that, she shouldn't really get an ex, man. Yeah. So why, for some reason, that for us that are dealing with the madness on the street, that just send them to one workshop or we just have a one chat with them and that's going to solve the problem. Are you seeing my point? Well, yeah, but that's the wider that. system. I that. I but that's that. the wider system that now, even in the context of racism as a system, we've also learned to accept the madness that we do. We're just going to throw it under the carpet and not deal with it. We need to deal with men that are angry in our community. We need to deal with men that are domestically violent in our community. We need to deal with men that are abusing their picnic sexually as well because yeah. all of those things well, exist yeah. in our community happening, so happening. we can't have those conversations and disregard mental health so then you start to understand the conversation that we're having right now about music is a lot deeper than you actually think way deeper it's way deeper but what and i'm glad that we've had this conversation today and i'm honored i'm going to say it again is because now we start to then understand the things that we need to do as a people before we start telling them what they should and what they shouldn't be doing. And that's why when I work with youths, I don't come from a place and telling them, you know what? I don't think you should be doing A, B, C, and D. Let's deal with your mental well-being first. And by you doing that, have you seen the direction change? In some cases, yeah. When you've dealt with... Not me, definitely. Not me, because I'm, I'm not a clinical Because I know you work with a lot of young people. Yes, most definitely. So have you ever had a case of... Because what I'm saying, and I know, Craig, I, yeah. your points are very yeah. valid, mm -hmm. but... I'm on the other side from where you're coming from. No, we're on the same no, side. No, 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 no. Me yeah. and you, yeah. what you're saying is fact, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying none of that's wrong. What I'm saying is the side you're coming from, as in from the streets, I'm seeing the other side, as in the other side. There was a lot of people who didn't, who weren't victims of these things we're talking about, Craig. Victims of what? The mental illness we're talking about. I disagree. I'm telling you there wasn't. I disagree. A lot of men chose that path. I disagree. A lot of men chose that path. Because what do you define as mental? Because we, no, we, right, we, let me, let me we only deal with okay, so let's we only deal let, with let's, the let's bring, let's bring it that though. Go let's on. bring it that though. Because you said that you don't believe people. Post traumatic are, slave syndrome. Okay, so define. You tell me what mental health is. Uh, I'm talking about things like, I'm talking about things like coming from um, coming from a background of systematic racism. I'm mm. talking about. All right, so, like, the, it, it, so the, the, this is my challenge. System. I hope I, I hope I'm the first that's going to challenge you on these. Please things. do. Please so I'm saying do. so. Come what on. is systematic racism? I'm talking about the school system. Yeah, I'm so, talking about so, how the school so tell handles. Me, so tell me, us in lesser class. I'm talking about things that I personally went through. Yeah, yeah. Mans that are bright yeah. that should be flourishing in school. Mm -hmm. They put you in lot. They put you in dumber classes. Yeah. This is the thing that's happened in Erdington. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about putting you in compromising situations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Headmasters that hate you. Yes. That hate I'm talking about I went to a school that most men that look like me didn't yes. do well fam. Yeah, yeah. And it weren't because they weren't bright. Yeah yeah. I'm mm -hmm. talking about that. The school I'm, system. Yeah, yeah I'm talking them. about the okay. schooling system. I'm yeah, talking yeah. about job opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about how we hangled yeah. on the road as mm -hmm. in we talk about stop mm -hmm. and search we talk about how the police handle us mm -hmm. we talk about how a lot of us are forced into crime yeah, yeah. that's what I'm talking about I'm talking about a lot of these individuals so where's our disagreement then because I'm saying there's some man who, 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 who never who never experienced that 
You yeah, still I'm, want I'm, it to be a part? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. But what I said to you, though, and if you remember what I'm saying to you, yeah. is that what we can't do is play this exception to the rule. Yes. And say that, yeah, because I didn't, yeah. or them two men didn't, all of us can't. Because there's a yeah. thing called variables. That's the case. The, things, is, that, the, things, that, the went, things that the things that add on to why we didn't, we have to also look at the man them that didn't and think, all right, then cool. So yeah, a man might have been bright, yeah. but what things didn't he have? I know and that's why I gave an, you the big on that's, analogies. That's, that's why that's why I gave you the uh, scenario of the 32 yards that was in the coldest set that I lived in Hockley. And that's why I want to give you a, I want to give you a little bit more. I want to give you an analogy. Yeah, go on. You got individuals who we all work, we all work. Yes. We come home from work, we're tired. Yes. We, we, we're family, man. Mm -hmm. You come home, you got individuals who are tired. Yes. They're going to eat McDonald's. Yeah. You know why? Mm -hmm. It's quicker, it's mm -hmm. easier. Yes. Then you got people who stand in front, in yes. front of the cooker and cook. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Some people want it now. Mm -hmm. There is that as well. Of course. There is that as well. And I do understand what you're saying. And mm -hmm. I don't want you to think. But I'm, I'm agreeing with that yeah. point that you just made. Yeah. I'm agreeing. There's people who want it now. I've seen a lot of mm -hmm. that. And what I'm saying, what the, another problem we do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm a big, big fan. I'm using, mm -hmm. I'm using the word fan yeah. of your work. Mm -hmm. I sat on YouTube and watched you for hours. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that we only deal with the perpetrators, fam. Mm -hmm. These men that are the, are these victims of mental health and this yeah, and that yeah, yeah. who mm. are running mad riot through the yeah, community. Yeah. We don't deal with the other side. Yeah, of course. Um, we made a film called Shutdown City. I mm -hmm. believe it's the only piece of work coming from the UK at this yeah. time mm -hmm. that we dealt with the victims' mentality yeah, yeah, of, course. of where the victims mm -hmm. affected. Yeah. A lot of these men that are banging and that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, a lot of these men can't work yeah, and won't work. Mm. And won't work, fam. So the mm. only way to get the money for the lifestyle they want to live it's is through, to do crime. Means. You get what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, is yeah. to do... Mm. Like, how much man want to really get up at five in the morning and, and, and not come back till five yeah, in yeah, the yeah, night? Yeah, yeah, how much yeah, man can do that? Yeah, yeah. And the other day, I was thinking about it and, 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 I, and I knew I wanted to ask you this and mm -hmm. I want you to give me one of them. Yes. I look around me and I look at a lot of man's around me, family, extended mm -hmm. family, associates, friends. Yeah. And you know what? And I looked and I went and realised, yo, most of them don't work. Mm. Most men, they don't work. Mm. And when I check it out and I think about school and I think about college mm. and I think about the hell that I personally went through yeah. with, with um, the dominant society treating yeah. me in a way that was, it yeah. was crazy. Mm. I was able to come through, like you said, yeah. I come from a, a good home and whatever mm. else. A lot of them are suffering in the sense of they don't want to be... It took me years to get back into the system yeah, yeah. and want to actually yeah. be under Likewise. someone who didn't look Likewise. like me. Mm. It took me a long time yeah, to be yeah. able to Likewise. do that. And what I'm saying to you is we've got to start looking at this as well. Yeah, but I'm saying I agree with that. Yeah, And I agree with that. And I think we're saying the same thing. We're just coming from different two different angles, positions. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that it's healthy that we have these conversations and look at the same thing, but multiple angles. Yeah. Because there's going to be people that are watching this are also going to have a perspective and I'm going to say to the audience that you're not wrong either. But I think that it's important that we break things down. Yeah. We don't do what the state do and yeah. just kind of throw over these things and say, yeah, but you're to blame. Yeah. Because yeah, we're to blame because we're the forerunners of things that's going on. But that also needs to be unpacked. Yeah. And I think just to address the idea about victims, I agree victims and the victim story is imperative to these particular types of issues. And I think for me, I find myself working with more victims than perpetrators personally. Yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, I get asked to talk about perpetrators. Yeah, you have to. So you it, have would, to. Yeah, it would yeah. seem though that I'm helping all the man them on the road that are doing <laughs> yeah, the madness. Yeah. Yeah. But in reality, I'm dealing with a man's mom. Yeah. I'm dealing with a man's little brother or sister. Who are victims. That are talking about committing suicide. That man that are talking about, you know what? I'm gonna start cutting my wrist car. I can't, can't function. They're the man that we encounter every single day, but it just seems that we're engaging more so with individuals that are the ones that are causing all of the problems in our society. And yeah. I think that yes, it's important that we talk about victims more. But what I argue is Dr. Francis Chris Ralston's notion of the impact of racism in our society because yeah. she argues that we're all victims every single one of us are victims yeah. in that same system even those that appear to have made it and been successful we're still victims of the same system why because that system has been created and designed with us not in thought and not in mind so that's why i rate man that boss through and do phenomenal things i rate girls that boss through and do phenomenal things 
But I also understand that the same system that we're functioning in is still designed for us to mash up at some point. And that's why we have to guard ourselves and we have to protect each other. Yeah. Even those little things that may manifest where a man be like, yo, you see them podcasts, man, you know, they're not really, you see them lines there and you allow that to manifest. Yeah, you know, that's true still. Yeah. My man there, you know what? You're not really working. And we do those things. Yeah. Like everything we see positive of our people, we knock it down. We look at the negative. We always look at the negative. Yeah. But a man that's doing negative, we don't even challenge yeah. it. We don't even ask the question. And you know how these things, even, and you know the worst thing about it is, yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the truth. Yeah. Are you, I'm guilty of this. Mm. I used to sit back. I had a few bad experiences. And then once I got through those experiences, I used to just sit back mm. and kind of watch the destruction. This man I went to school with, gone. Yeah, yeah. That man that I went to play scheme with, gone. Mm. That man from Saturday school, yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I seen that destruction. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until the 2011 riots when I looked and said, what's going on? Yeah. And then there was no outlet, no discussion, nowhere. Mm. That's what started this. Yeah, yeah. Because I looked and I wanted to hear the real. Mm. And what these mainstream media outlets tend to do is get and I'm going to call names and no disrespect to these names, but they'll get a Dizzy Rascal mm. who's a musician. Mm. They'll get a Big Nasty who's like a comedic kind of a guy to discuss serious issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I realised, yeah. hold on a second, we ain't even, back in the day when my dad used to talk, he used to say like, you had PCRL and you had this and that. Mm. Them things slowly disappeared yeah, and yeah, we yeah. weren't in mm. control of our own mm. narrative. Yeah, of course. We weren't in control. And when we're not in control of our narrative again, that's when we kind of internalize the messages that are out there for our, also our self-destruction because then we yeah. start to believe those narratives and that's where we come up with these ideals of you know we're the problem yeah we're the ones that's doing all the violence we're the one that's hurting each other and we are hurting each other in one sense but if you look at that in a wider sense there was way more violence in the country coming from other communities yeah. compared to ours and it's because it's not glorified I Which think it, I know you it, call no, but, it. You no, but, call it like no, but, there's no, no song. There's no. No, it, no but it is, it is glorified. But what I'm saying, it's there's a conceded effort to make it look like we are the one that are glorifying something from a subculture that we've adopted yeah. and adapted to. That's not ours, because yeah. when you look at hooliganism, for example, it's there. It is. If it's you look fact. in the right places, it's, it's there. The fact is there. It's there. So with the glorification of violence, is there. But it's through whose lens? And going back to your point again, if we're not owning the narrative and we're not owning where that narrative goes and it gets marketed a certain type of way, we then believe that it's us, us that's doing it. But yeah. it's there. There's, there's, no, there's no hidden... People say things like, oh, they don't talk about certain types of things in, in the news. I say, but what news are you reading? Yeah. What papers are you reading? Because what I'd like to see is an album... Where a hooligan man who was in control. I know they've made many yeah, films. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. you could call it, mm. some people could say it's glorification. Others yeah, yeah. could say it's mm -hmm. um, um, documents of history. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, where were these hooligans on, on YouTube making mm. songs, telling their youth mm. on a Friday or a Saturday when the football's on, I'm down there smashing this man's yeah, head yeah. in. They do it you in know what I mean? Yeah, they do it in different ways. But like, like what I'm saying, mm. the problem with, with, with why I call into question a lot of our community yes. Because I'm saying, stop glorifying it. Mm -hmm. And I understand that we need to speak about the pain that's going on. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I see yeah. a lot of glorification, mm -hmm. Craig. No. I, I, just, I, don't, I don't know if I made it explicit. I'm not saying we... we I'm saying is when I analyse what they're saying, yeah. I hear pain. Yeah, yeah, because you're about, looking at it in a different they're way. They're not yeah. talking about pain. Yeah. They're talking about licking man's heads up. Yeah, 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 just yeah, yeah, yeah. met that clear. Man that looked like what them. they're talking about that looked like them. Yeah. It's been marketed a certain type of way because that's what... The consumers want yeah. can't ignore the consumers, you know. Yeah, man's yeah, buying yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah buying man's this. buying this, and yeah. as I said, we can't ignore supply and demand in that same capitalist society. If man wanted hooligan man to do that, they would do it, but nobody don't want them to do it. Yeah. So that's the reason why you're not going to see it on YouTube because there's no need for them to do it. But you go into certain sections of white society, there is a supply for certain behaviors that exist, but it's just not appealing to us. Yeah. And it's not appealing to the consumers. But those that are involved in that are going to tell you that it is. How do mm. I know that? I went to a conference yesterday. Yeah. said to them, do you know what drill music is? No. See my point? Yeah, yeah, yeah Those yeah, that yeah, want yeah. it yeah. don't need to know what drill music is. Those it don't that affect want it, them. find it, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's not affecting them. Their children may know about drill music, 
But they might listen to it and think, you know what, this tune's hard. I'm even going to buy the album. But the reality don't affect me because I'm coming from private education. I'm nice. On the yeah. weekends, I go this society. I go this club. I go dance. I got this drumming lesson. They've got so many other things that they don't need to listen to those messages and believe that, you know what, that's just the way that life is. And that's why I went back to my earlier point. And let's look at the regular you that lives in the inner city and the options and understanding the system, understanding that education is failing them at a rapid rate, which yeah. the Department of Education have agreed and understood that's happening. Housing, um, know that they're not providing appropriate housing for people in the community. There's no jobs. The government have been saying that they need to pump in more jobs. There's nothing going on in the community. So the options that appear, and I say the word appear with a capital A, that seem available are the things that are negative. Yeah. And the things that seem to be criminal. And that's why they're buying into it in a wider system that says, you know what? Yeah, man. That's what we want anyway. Yeah. We want you, man, to talk about that. We want you, man, to do that. We want you, man, to be criminals. And guess what? Even if you make it, I'm still going to make your life hell. So you come out and don't use your bank card and you put 50 grand on your car seat. I'm going to lock up your class because that's what we actually think about you. Yeah. But at the same time, we're still buying into it. So again, it's the mindset. But it's still being promoted. The situation you're talking about, it's still being promoted as, if I'm legit now, mm -hmm. and I'm making that type of money, why I want, why I want 50 grand in cash? Why, am I, why do I need to make a statement of having 50 mm -hmm. grand in cash? Is that something that I want it to be deemed as though I'm on the mm -hmm. road still? Do I want it to be promoted mm -hmm. as though I'm still living a certain yes. type of way? Mm -hmm. But then when the... The, the, the law enforcement pull me over I'm saying it's all legit it's yeah, all legal yeah, 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 but yeah. when I'm rolling yeah, with mm -hmm. it it's yo I want it to seem mm -hmm. like I'm on the mm -hmm. road and yeah this is dirty mm -hmm. fam that's clean fam that ain't dirty that should, should be in the bank and that's that right. should there's no establishment mm -hmm. that and I can tell you this there's no establishment that you could be possibly spending 50 grand in that want it in cash anyway. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Nobody. Yeah, yeah. But those, but those, whether it's true and, and or not. And I think that's why I was talking about the identity crisis that we have. Yeah. Because you and I know just exactly what you said. Yeah. I'm not doing that. that. I'm rating a man that's pulling out a special card. Yeah, man. You get what I'm saying? Like, yo, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah I want to be like them, man. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Because any, any individual, even from a criminal background that seeks to make it to the point of looking clean, He's not trying to do that either. Exactly. But that's the message that certain men want to push. And you look in the comment section, these youth, and I'm telling you this myself, mm -hmm. yeah, I got youth mm -hmm. in my family, whatever, mm -hmm. younger youth that I they do love that. every day. And they'll they say, that. yo, my mum was all in yeah, 50 yeah, racks. 50 bags, happy. Like, fam. I've had yeah, friends yeah. our age, don't get it, it's not the youth. <laughs> yeah, 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 we, There's we, men we, our we, age as well that will look at that and be like, yo, that is certain be 30 to look up to. You've got a certain, certain to look up to. And, it, and, and so it's like, this is what I say, it's like, it is mental illness. It mm. is that because it's like, we've adopted this me goals, the baby, and I rate them man, by the mm. way, but we've adopted how them man live, like wads of cash, Mayweather. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we're looking at that, mm. but England don't run like that. This yeah, is different. Yeah. This is the brains of the beast. But it will come. Them it man are come. in the belly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. This is the brains. Mm. So you rolling with 50K, like I said, mm. is almost like your... And you put it on Snapchat. Yeah, you yeah, haven't yeah, done yeah. it in silence. You're opening the door. You're for... saying to the police, yeah, yeah, yeah. yo, yeah, come for me. I don't want no police bothering mm. me. Yeah, yeah. Let me strap 50 in, then we start mm. the 50 grand challenge. Yeah, yeah. You get Madness. me? But what have we got in the committee? So if, if yeah. that money's nothing, mm. what's my man done in his yeah, community, yeah. fam? And I'm not saying mm. he has to do nothing, but what is he, you know what I mean? If that's yeah, nothing yeah. to him, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. And then Pete, and then Utes, and that's what I'm saying. When I went, mentioned my point earlier about twofold, the youths that watch that, observe that, and believe, you know what, that's how I want to be. Yeah. So in order for me to get the 50 bags, I'm going to have to do some madness because I ain't getting 50 bags trying to get a normal nine to five job. Exactly. Does that make sense? Exactly. So I'm going to have to do madness. Back to the And analogy. the only option to do uh, madness. But what that individual's not doing is actually saying, you know what, I actually work for these 50 bags. Exactly. But I'm going to put the illusion, and that's the word that I want to use today, to create that illusion to make them believe that in order to get these 50 bags, you have to do that. And that's the reason why this concept of get rich or die trying that mindset's ultimately there. So when you hear these rappers that talk about their past experiences yeah. before they've made it, what they do 
consciously or subconsciously, is talk about where they're, where they're at in terms of their life. But what they forget that's happening is that the youths that you're pushing that music out to are living in the real time. Yeah. So I can say, you know what? I made 60 bags off the trap, but you live in a mansion now. You live in an apartment in Kensington. Yeah. So you're talking about your past experiences. I get it if that's, that's a narrative that a lot of these rappers say. Yeah. I'm only talking about my past experiences and the things that I've went to. I'm not here to argue about that. But when you push that out, the you that's on the estate or in the cul-de-sac or on the street is listening to that from where they are in real time. So when they're saying making 60 from the trap, I'm trying to actually get into the trap to get that 60 bags. Yeah. But you've made the 60 bags from going going on tour. Exactly. So there's the illusion that's created that in order to get the 60 bags right now, I need to do a madness in order to get it. And why it's even more damaging. Yeah, and I forgot to even say these people on the uh, the podcast is, and we'll just I'll just say the, the names when Fredo's rolling with that fifty grand okay. in cash, yeah. and a youth looks at that. Yeah, from our community, he looks like mm. me and you. He's gonna look and say, "My man's killing it. He's got fifty yeah. grand. There. He's made it." But the man who gave him that fifty grand ain't showing the fifty yeah. grand. How much has he got? He's not even trying to be in the scene. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So we want to be Fredo. We don't want to be the man who put Fred or one to the 50 grand. We want to be the man who's rolling with the... The man who's behind him, because I heard Master P say mm. on Drink Champs, Master P said he turned on a million dollar offer and he goes, if them men are willing to give me a black man from the hood a million, million what am I really worth? Fam? Yeah, of course. So yeah, yeah. the youths need to look yeah, beyond yeah. this. So mm. this is what I say. Mm. Sometimes it's how you look at things too. Mm. Because you can look and say... My man's singing this 50 grand. What They love this. Mm. They want him to do that. Mm. Show the f- They want 50 grand yeah, challenges. Yeah, yeah. The real man behind who gave him the 50 grand, mm. he's probably got 500 yeah, grand. Yeah, of course. You see what I'm saying? And to play that, with. And that goes back to my original point about education and why education is important and people that educate youths from what I call the perspective of the streets that yeah. understand what they're talking about, that understand the illusions, that understand that conceded effort to make them fall into that trap that I talk to them quite regularly about that can give them those kind of ideas that, you know what? You don't have to be the man in front of the camera. You can be the man behind the camera. You actually can be behind the man that creates the the company for the cameras to come from. Facts. Does that make sense? You don't have to have nothing to do with the cameras. You can have just a thing where men are renting the situation from you and you'll actually make more money than being in front of the camera. Which is what we're trying to do here. This is what... This is where education becomes important. And I think that I'm glad that you're ch- mentioning these points because people just assume that you to know, that know this stuff. You go into the educational system, the educational system does not teach our kids these things. Yeah, It doesn't teach them how to be independent. It teaches them this idea or notion that in order to make it, you need to work for somebody else. It doesn't build entrepreneurs. Yeah. It doesn't build business-like thinking. So when you have that mindset of, I'm going to work for somebody else, you can see where, how easy it is these youths can just fall for the trap and fall for the illusion. Because that's the only time Because that's the only thing that they're going to see. So it is important that we understand that as well, that education becomes important. Supplement education becomes really important. The education that you give to your kids in the the household, making making them see more than what is available. Use these scenarios that you see. Ask them how much you think these men make on tour. Then ask them how do you think they how much do you reckon their tour manager makes. Ask them how much you think their label makes, and then get them to think. Okay, well, what would you need to do in order to become the independent record artist, the independent owner of a particular type of company? What what are the steps in order to get that? And when you speak to most men in the community, they'll tell you they've never had. Somebody that's had that conversation for one. For me, that's quite scary. And that's why I went back to my point earlier is that we, we're kind of having these conversations about what's happening, what's not happening with the youth. But we're not talking about, well, what do we need to be doing with the youth? Yeah. And I think with this particular issue, and I'm not saying education is the only way, but as Malcolm X said, education is a powerful tool if it's used wisely. Facts. And I think when we engage with our young people in our community that believe in these negative mindsets, it's a counter-narrative. Because you got to remember, this narrative that's going out on all of these channels, it's a narrative, not yeah. necessarily agreeing with it, 
But these things like this podcast is a counter narrative. The work we do in the community is a counter narrative. Yeah. The work that we do in schools with schools is a counter narrative. Talking to a youth on the road is a counter narrative. So if we're not investing in counter narratives and counter narrative meaning opposite to the madness, then how do we expect our young people to fulfill their full potentials in an environment, in a society that don't want them to make it? How are we expecting them to come out of these illusions? Because yeah. there's things that have come out in the public domain that talk about women and um, beauty and suicide and mental health as it relates to social media. But we're not having this conversation as it relates to our black young males and yeah. the information that they're receiving. And the point that I'm making is also that is part of the problem as well. That everything that we do, we assume that it's just part of our culture, but anybody else does it, it's to do with their mental health, it's to do with the issues that are affected by them in their communities, and is that kind of normality of, yeah, yeah, that's the reason why we need to do things, and that's the reason why we need to change things in policy, but for us, just lock them up and throw away the key, or section them, because that's the reason why they're doing what they're doing, because it's part of their culture, and I'm saying those of us that come through it, understand it, have experienced yeah. it and made positive contribution to our community. We need to start turning around and saying, you know what? We need to start pulling some of these youths, whether it's in business, whether it's in housing, whether it's in entertainment, whether it's in education, whatever kind of facet that you sit from and have a platform and have the ability to engage. You need to use that platform in order yeah. to change the youth. So mental health, how do we move forward? I think when we talk about the concept of mental health, I think it's understanding what mental health is and what it isn't. I think when we talk about mental health or when mental health is mentioned, especially in our community, we see it as an offence. It's something that we shouldn't talk about. Um, it's something that we shouldn't engage. I think why? Because historically, mental health has always been an issue where we've been treated unfairly um, by the state. And whether that may mean that we've been, by compared to any other group, that we've been sectioned more, we've been given um, more drugs and more severe drugs that's impacted um, in terms of our cognitive ability to be able to do um, specific types of things. Mental health in our community has always been seen as a threat because it was used against us historically and also in present day. Yeah. So I think when we talk about mental health, I like to come from a place of well-being and understanding where we are and what we are. But in saying that, I think it also needs to be a perspective on how we look at mental health. You've got to also understand that most, the majority of mental health services that are in the Western Hemisphere, let's just talk about the UK or Birmingham in particular, most of the mental health services that are available to our people come from a Eurocentric standpoint come from a Eurocentric perspective, meaning the ways in which they evaluate, the ways in which they seek to treat us, comes from a perspective that is absent to our understanding on how we do things every single day. So, for example, I went to a... a um, I've been blessed because of my networks to do some work in um, a mental health institution. I won't say the name, but it's probably one of the most high-risk mental health um spaces for young people yeah. and these young people in particular were all in um for issues to do with knife crime yeah. and when i walked into the building predominantly middle class white workers that were in there walked in onto the wing yo 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 fat yo yo magic magic yo traders are sick hot yo yo jordan yo jordan i was saying yeah my man just does this every single day so I said, does what? Don't even know what my man's talking about. But I said, he's talking about my trainers. Oh! <laughs> huh? Yeah, he just mentioned my trainers. Said my trainers are sick. That's what he was talking about. The shock on their faces after that statement. And it hurt me, bothered me for ages. And you know why it bothered me? It bothered me only because this young man is not well. And he's in an environment where people don't even understand him. They don't even understand what he's saying. They don't even understand what he likes and what he don't like. So because we don't understand him, I'm going to over-medicate him because it just seems like what he's talking about is madness. But it never sounded like madness to me yeah. because that's just how my little cousin would talk. 
when I walk in, it's like, yo, <laughs> yo, the <laughs> maxes is there hard, you know, bro. That's very normal to me. So I go back to my point that if we're talking about mental health, I think it's important that there needs to be a African-centered approach to mental health. And I'm, I'm advising those that are probably observing this, that are involved in mental health services, that are seeking to understand mental health. There is a complete effort to remove African-centered perspectives on mental health as a tool to help save our people. And how I know that I've got friends that are studying counselling. I've got friends that are studying studying psychiatry. I've got friends that are studying therapy. And I say to them, what books do you have that's looking at that? Who's Franz Fanon? Who's W.E.D. Boys? Who's Dr. Francis Cress Welsin? Who are these people? Are their theories and ideas about blackness inferior to the models and the ideas of those that are projected within the educational system? I say no. But that's my point. So when you look at Dr. Martin Glynn's work, when he looked at why young men are not in the prison system, are not going for therapeutic intervention yeah. to deal with their madness, one of these key findings was is because none of the systems and the models that are being used with our people understand our people. So why would I engage? Why am I going to engage with them with my mental health with a woman that don't even understand what I'm talking about? So it means then we need to try and find new ways of engaging our people from the perspective of mental health. So I'm not going to tell a man, Yo, you need to go chat to my man because he's a mental health worker. I might not even use that word. Yeah, He's just a man that wants to help the man them. Oh yeah, what does he want to talk about? Man, just, he just likes to talk about life. Yeah. You start talking to a man and you start engaging with him. You see the words that are used. I never use the word mental health. Yeah. But what that man's doing is the same thing that someone will be like, you know what, I'm a mental health worker. Can I uh, talk to you about something? Because psychologically, whether consciously or subconsciously, thing the messages come from me just with the label, mental health. Yeah. Cause I'm saying I'm not mad, blood. Who's yeah. saying that I'm mad? But most of our young people are walking around with undiagnosed trauma. To see a man get stabbed is traumatic. Yeah. To watch a man get rushed is traumatic. To see a man get attacked is traumatic. And there is something called secondary victimization. There is something called secondary trauma that I do not need to be there to hear a story and be traumatized about that story. So when I'm watching something online that appears to be madness, I can be traumatized. But guess what? In the book of mental health disorders, it's acknowledged that people that see violence, people that are exposed to violence, whether primary or secondary, can I have a psychological impact on the way that they behave? So I'll go back to my point, and this is what I'm talking about, the system of racism. But when it's us, though, what we do is rationalize the behavior. What we do is blame each other for that behavior. But I'm telling you that from a, a mental health disorder book, of all of the disorders, they acknowledge things like violence, knife crime, gun crime as a traumatic experience. So our man them that are talking about these things, that are experiencing these things, that are putting it on camera, we are traumatizing each other every single day. So when I talk about mental health, I'm saying mental health is something that is definitely needed to address with our people from an African-centered perspective. Because yeah, a lot of us deal with it wrong as well. Um, how we deal, like, we all here, have, you know, in our community, we have family members who go through periods and... You know, and we, we we tend to only relate it to straight jackets. Yeah, yeah. Man yeah. getting injected. Mm -hmm. So we ignore these things. Yeah, yeah. We I've ignore seen, the signs. I've seen mm -hmm. it happen. Yeah, yeah. We ignore it. We, we they, they, This person's crying for help. Until it gets Pray extreme. for them. We bring mm -hmm. them to the Christian church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will solve their problem. Nans and that, catching yeah, yeah. Holy Ghost. Just make them go to church and everything. <laughs> you get me? All right. Like, we, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, act, yeah. we act like it's something that yeah, man yeah. can just, just... Nah, it needs yeah, yeah. help, fam. But, but you see that point there? This is where <laughs> I'm going to challenge you, though. Yeah. Because that point, the statement that you just made right there yeah. is the same thing I was trying to say to you earlier. Yeah. To just say, oh, you have to just channel the man them into... So say that I'm using your own statement against you. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah, saying yeah. that's the point that I'm making. Yeah. That we need to go through a process that's going to enable us to think cognitively different. We're going to yeah. need to go through a process that make us feel different yeah. 
And anybody that does anything from a mental health perspective will tell you that if your brain has been rewired because of trauma, because of experiences that are negative, until you rewire back that brain, it's forever going to be in a state of heightened sensitivity. Yeah, that's why you see the man them just moving. You see man that just move like that all the and time. The, and there is, yeah. and there is, and there is, there's genuinely mans like that. Yep. I can easily, I can go back and think and say, out of 20 men that was in, involved in madness, five were genuinely bottling for help. Yeah, they yeah. were, they were mm. sick. Mm. But there was 15 mm. who wasn't fam. Mm. So when I make my statements, even on the podcast, yeah, I'm talking about the mans who know better. Yeah, That's course. why we say, if you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you get me? You know better, should, you should yeah. do better. That's why of we course. say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certain mm. man, mm. they want the McDonald's fam. They want the mm. quick fix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How am I going to mm. live like this fam? Mm. I ain't going to live like that working yeah, fam. Because yeah. we're sick bro. Man, man I have to put their hand yeah, up to piss yeah, in certain of jobs, course. you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. There's certain jobs man are doing mm. where to piss. They yep. have to raise their hand and ask. Yeah, no, steep. it's a fact. It's deep, it's deep. And I've said it's it to yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. I've said it enough time. I said, why? I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, I couldn't do it. Man, have to do it though. Do it. So you're getting you just sound treated like, like what we call a boy yeah, yeah. Mm. in a place of mm. work. Mm. So I understand what you're saying, and and, and and you deal with it very well. There is men that are sick out there. Mm. I got family members that were sick, mm. but then there's men who are genuinely. Mm. I th- and I think you know what? Me. I think we're all sick. We're all sick. Break that down, fam. Every single one of us is sick. Yeah. But the way we deal with our sickness is different. Facts. I go back to my point again. We're all sufferers of the system that was designed to make us feel a certain type of way and behave a certain way. And when I say the word sick, you know, I don't mean that we're, done, we're doing something wrong. Yeah. I'm just saying that we're victims of a wider system that makes us sick. So the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we behave amongst each other. And I think that many of us that are achieving, we're going through processes that enable yeah. us to understand our sickness. And it's something that, you know, I talk to my man them about all the time. Just this week, there was certain my man posted something in the group. And the, the first statement the man them said is, we are sick because it's a collective sickness. Yeah. We need to stop being individuals. I think that's the, the overriding thing that I'm saying today is that we are sick. Yeah. We need to understand we as a people are sick because we haven't healed. And this is not about, you know, pulling a race car. This is not talking about, you know what, just blaming the past. But I think we need to understand the pain that we've gone through historically and how that's brought us today to the point that we're even rationalizing our sickness. Yeah. And that's what we see, you know, it was just the other day when the whole Brexit thing started and you see our, even our own people telling people that are migrating to this country from war-torn countries that they should go back home. Facts. It's that sickness. But, but then it comes Because we were, we were the ones that were, that was us. That was when us. When mine come. But that do you us. understand the sickness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that sickness. Yeah, that was Because us. we have now developed and that's why I use the word illusion. We've picked up this illusion now that because now we've got this new middle class that we're not them no more from the ends. We're not like them no more. Cause, you know, we got a job now. We're paying our bills. We got our wife, and you know, we got a yard, and the lights you know, is on. You know, everything's Food nice. The I'm not like them from the ends no more. Yeah. So we've created that 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 illusion of a middle class, and not yeah. to get too academic. What Karl Barks used to always talk about: the rich and the poor, and the middle class is an illusion. It's an illusion for us because there ain't no middle class because we're still consuming to keeping the man upstairs rich. Facts. And then when you look at the concept of black Marxism, I can't just use them and I've just been talking about Eurocentric education and you talk about black Marxism, it says that, yeah, but even if we're making it, we're still seven times more likely to be stopped and searched. We're That's still that. nine times more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. We're still eight times more likely to be sentenced harshly compared to our white counterparts, even though we've made it. Exactly. So it's important that we understand that though because there's a lot of us that go through where we go through and acknowledge, you know, I'm blessed the fact that, you know, I was put in a situation where I was able to educate myself, got four degrees, trying to get my doctorate, almost going to be complete. But even in my institution, I'm asked, uh, am I a security guard? Uh, Even in my institution, I'm asked, do I (laughs) I teach sport? I have all the degrees that are in the building. I must only teach sport. So I understand that the system ain't changed. 
So that's yeah. why I don't use the exception to the rule that, yeah, I may have evolved out of the hood from the mandem, but I'm still on a plantation yeah. that is still designed for not me to be in the house where the master is. And I understand that very clearly, but there's not enough of us that don't. And I think it's important that we have those conversations. Like, man's will call up for that. For, will call up like, ah, the man's on the podcast, the ABC, da 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 da. They will, but the same man them are sitting down watching Piers Morgan. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And agreeing this, with his narrative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same man that would say that are watching Piers Morgan and saying, yo, my man's real, you know, fam, da 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 da. Mm-hmm. Like, but then they'll say, but you will have to come down. You will have to come down and put on workshops. Yeah. You have to go in the community. But then there's next man, if you fall, reporting on that fall, mm. who ain't in the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know here where I'm coming from? Yeah, here at all. This is what mm. I'm saying. But then man will only target a man that looks like him. Real talk. So, mm. Greg, it's been a, a absolute honor. And we're going to do this. We're going to do, we're gonna do so it we're gonna take, There's going to be a million things that come <laughs> yeah, from yeah, this. Man. And you're going to be like, we ain't touched it. But you know what? And again, I think, I think it's important. And I think one of my kind of philosophies is it's about bringing the bridging the gap between academic and the streets. That's you know, it. that man have knowledge, but how are we translating that? And that really comes from Malcolm X's teachings. That's why I rate Malcolm X and he's the favorite teacher that I never got to meet because he made his education manifest in the road where man occupy that particular you space. You're watching Godfather of Harlem? You do that. Say that again. Are you watching Godfather of Harlem? I'm going to. Uh, on the it, list. It, it, don't worry. You know, so that yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Don't, yeah, don't yeah, talk yeah. too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on the team. You Watch know that. what I'm saying? But the trailer alone's got me gassed. I'm watching it still. I'm not gassed, so, bad. Um, but definitely it's been an honor and I know it's been time. You know, we've known each other for years and yeah, just to kind of connect, you know, on this level, um, I thank you. And I just yeah, hope that the audience really benefit from what we're putting out here because it's real. And as you said, in terms of the output of the counter narrative, there's not many of us out there are doing that. And it's about what information and where does the information go um, and how do people use that? So keep doing what you're doing, man. And as I said, for me, this is black excellence. You know, even the building Likewise, that we're in, I said it to Natty early though, it's excellence and we need to continue to do that because the youths them need to come into these buildings and say, well, in jury quarter, man is doing this. Yes, <laughs> man is doing Facts. this. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. important that, I don't know that you not probably need to do a show of just walking around the building and saying what's available because we don't know. We need to stop assuming, I said that earlier, we need to stop assuming that people know that there's people in our community that are doing exceptional things. Not just me, enough of us. Yeah. But how are we using that counter-narrative? And you, man, are using the counter narrative we have to cross in one market, particular way. Simple. We have to cross markets we and support to. each other. So the pleasure's ours, fam, for real, because we, like you said, for a long time, man, I've seen you with my mom, and you get what I'm saying? Like I said, I know your cousin, and mm. it's just about connecting the dots. Of course. And making mm. it happen, man. So, mm. Craig. King. Every time. Yeah, man. Yeah? Yeah, man. Peace. As you know, the things we discuss on YouTube are heavily censored. So to hear that uncensored stuff, head over to our Patreon channel, take a look on screen right now to see the type of topics we discuss, the type of live streams, the type of behind the scenes footage. All we ask is a small amount of $1, which is the equivalent of about 75 pence per month and you get access to all of this content plus many more. So join us right now. And listen to over a hundred podcasts that have not been released on any other platform other than Patreon. See you soon.